Welcome to another Me and BPD episode. I'm Joe Cadero and I am your Chief of Police. And today I have a special guest with me. I'd like to introduce you to Melissa Batchilder. She's recently come on to the PD as our Communications Director. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. Melissa, maybe you could tell our audience a little bit uh, about you and what you're doing with uh, our Police Department. Sure. Perhaps if I share a bit about my background, um, that will be helpful. I spent most of my career flipping between uh, news reporting and later in corporate communications in both Canada and the U.S. before I settled in New York for a number of years doing corporate communications. And then arrived in uh, Massachusetts a few years ago and worked in Boston doing communications. And essentially what that means is um, I'm a professional storyteller. My passion is in finding stories and helping people bring their stories to life. One of the things that I found um, most compelling about being at the department is the number of untold stories that I see happening every day. And I'm hoping that through some of my expertise with social media, that uh, we're able to start bringing those to life in a more you know, relatable way for our community here. So I um, want to flip the script though and talk to you a bit about the last few months and how, you know, how life and work at the police department has shifted mm. in the light of COVID-19. So maybe you can take me back to January and just tell me a bit about what the department went through during that time. Sure, so when, uh, take everybody back to January, which seems like so long ago since we've have to manage this pandemic. But in January, you know, all the news media was just really starting to heat up with reporting about what was going on in China. And uh, we started to pay attention and started to slowly start thinking about what we were gonna have to do here with the PD. Start looking at uh, our protocols, our policies. And then shortly thereafter, as we entered the month of February, you could really see that this was becoming a reality here in the United States. Uh, so we started putting out that information to our, the members of our department, keeping them informed uh, about what we were learning about the pandemic as fast as we got information, as, uh, as fast as we wanted to get it out. Um, but before we go on, I just want to say when you're talking about storytelling, not to divert from your list of questions, is that you're, you're right. We have a lot of wonderful stories to tell you in the PD because we have wonderful men and women that are serving every day. And I just want to take that moment to tell everybody how grateful I am for the work that they do, both sworn and non-sworn personnel, because we have heroes in the cruises and we have heroes in our dispatch and inside our headquarters. Excellent. So what were those early days and long nights um, in terms of preparation for the, the pandemic? What so did that it, look like? Right, so when, as the pandemic started to uh, really reveal itself to us here and evolve, we too had to start to evolve really rapidly and be very flexible. So what that meant is we started having discussions internally uh, with our command staff, the deputy chief, myself, the captains, and you know with the other city agencies, emergency management, Brian Nubriga, and the, the mayor, his staff, and started to think about all the varying protocols and policies that we had to put in place that were non-existent. We never had a need for it. So uh, a lot of hours of brainstorming discussions and reading uh, a lot of material that was coming at us fast and furious. So I've said this to you before at work and to many of the uh, members of the department that I, I was simply so impressed and often overwhelmed by the approach that the command staff took to ensuring that your officers and your your buildings, your civilian staff, that they were all so well prepared. What was the fuel behind that? What drove your need to be so ahead of the game? You know, my, myself and, you know, the deputy, and I, and I think the mayor's office, uh, and for me personally, and you talk about sleepless nights, uh, you know, I didn't want any of our staff members to really get sick and 
you know, the, the worst that always comes to mind. So that was always in the forefront of my mind, keeping our people safe, keeping them healthy, and keep them at work, retaining our staff level so that we could perform our services to the community. Because if I start to lose staff, then that minimizes our ability um, to give the quality of services that our citizenry is accustomed to and probably is going to need more than ever during this pandemic. So when I tell when you say sleepless nights, uh, literally, especially when we hit the month of April, when we started to have some of our members that were testing positive, uh, started to really impact me personally. Uh, and one member in particular, he was, became very ill. So it was sleepless nights for many of us. So we've seen both dispatchers and officers really shine throughout this pandemic and um, we've been recognized several times, you know, in the news and via social media. So I'm, I'm hoping you can reflect a bit about what kind of change dispatchers mm. had to go through in order to successfully navigate the pandemic. Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, talking about another group of people that are unsung heroes in our department, it's our dispatchers and our call takers. So for them to come to work every day, and one of their biggest skill sets that they have to use is to be able to communicate verbally. And then when we throw a mask on them for eight hours a day, it's very difficult to breathe with a mask all day long and have to continuously verbalize that communication. It, it's straining and it can be claustrophobic and it does create a level of anxiety. We kind of shun them off from the rest of the department and don't allow anybody in that room except themselves. Um, so level of anxiety and the mental toughness that they've had to deal with, uh, they're clearly unsung heroes. Uh, and then we had an individual that was positive in that room, and it's a very small room. It, it starts to impact everybody else starting to think about are they going to contract the virus and take it home to their families. And it, it can play havoc with one's mental health and, and self-anxiety. So uh, they've done an amazing job back there, and I'm very grateful. In, uh, has the call screening shifted at all when someone calls for service? Can you? Yeah, so take some us of the protocols we, we did have to change, that's a good point, is we we're asking our call takers to ask a series of questions to assess the individuals that are calling in their exposure to COVID 19 or even if they're positive in order to you know, minimize the interaction between our police, exposure to our police officers and our other first responders. So when it came to officers, though, that was another different shift that um, you and your command staff managed to um, you know, really prepare you know, beyond measure. What were some of the changes that they faced? We, in, in fact, there's an article that was recently in the Standard Times that shone a bit of a light on it, but maybe you can tell me a bit more about the difference that the difference between policing in New Bedford in January and in May, at the end of May. Yeah, a big difference, one that none of us could uh, have forecasted. Uh, but our officers, you know, um, to their credit, uh, and that's what makes it so much easier for us, is we have a great cadre of police officers. Uh, we're requiring them to wear masks at high risk calls for service where we know that someone's been screened for high exposure or is positive COVID-19 to begin with. Uh, we took our two officer units and we split them. So all our units right now are single officers to minimize interaction there as well as exposure. And we've uh, armed our officers with a variety of masks from N95s to K95s to cloth masks and we armed them as also with face shields to use and the plastic aprons for protection and of course gloves. Uh, but we've also given them extra masks to hand out to people if they need to communicate with them at a distance if they must have face-to-face -face interaction. We also ask people to come to their doors whenever possible to communicate with the officers instead of going inside. But for the officers to communicate with a mask is also a challenge to communicate clearly and concisely, especially if they have to give commands or render uh, medical uh, attention. Um, I remember at the end of April and the beginning of, um, or I'm sorry, at the end of March, beginning of April, one of the ongoing mantras that I would hear so often was, toss a mask, toss a mask. Yeah. 
you know, and I was really impressed with how, um, just how resilient officers were to be able to go from, you know, their, their standard practice to always thinking of another human being first, you know, while at the same time, you know, protecting themselves through that simple gesture of, you know, just toss them a mask, so. Yeah, that, that's really, uh, it, it's great to hear that from you, Melissa, uh, because you're still fairly new with us, so you're bringing a whole fresh uh, set of eyes and observations, so that's, that's wonderful to hear. But uh, our officers also, we've uh, eliminated uh, their interaction inside the police department. We're not doing roll calls like we traditionally done. We're either using, in some cases, Zoom. Other cases, we're having officers coming in at different times so that the sergeant can give uh, more distance, one-on-one -on -one exchange of information. We're using electronic devices to do that. We're asking our officers not to do the reports in the station, to do them in the car. We want our officers out of the police stations as much as possible, which is different for the officers. They are accustomed to uh, interacting inside the station where they're brother and sister officers, their colleagues, exchanging information physically. So that's been a big change, as it is for the whole country. We're used to having social interaction, mm -hmm. where creatures that thrive on human interaction. So that's been a big change for them as well. So I, I follow the news um, a lot. I spend a lot of time reading about police departments and the state of the nation. And something that I was so proud of was the story that early on you guys were you you were out there and ready did you ever imagine that you would be so far ahead of the game in comparison with other agencies that were struggling for ppe and other forms of protection i mean the department really was fast out of that gate yeah we uh we came out of hard we had a, a great team internally we have a, a great support team here you know, with the mayor's office and emergency management, uh, Brian O'Brieger and the fire department uh, and uh, emergency medical services. We all got together, first responders, uh, departments in the city, with the city, and we work collectively as a team. As I always like to refer our city as city of one. And we, everybody just came together and started uh, working collectively, uh, internally and externally. Um, a city of one certainly sounds like a perfect equation for collaboration. And that seems to be something that was a driving force behind the entire city's success. I, I think so. I think we've been operating like that for a very long time. We have a great city here, a great community, and of course a great police department. Uh, but when everybody came together during this crisis, you can, it really highlights that phrase, a city of one. You know, from City Hall to all the first responder departments in the city, and the employees of all those departments, and of course the community. Great, thank you. We're gonna take a break right now and uh, we'll be back to chat a bit later. Great, don't go away. <laughs>
Well, welcome back to Meet NBPD, another episode, and I'm here with Melissa Batchilder. And uh, Melissa, why don't you continue on? So I'm going to pick up where I left off and um, talk about one of my favorite stories that uh, I've been witness to since joining the department. And that was the celebration parade, initially for frontline workers at St. Luke's. And then I'm going to get you to tell me a bit, uh, a bit about another parade that we held later on. But can you tell me about what prompted the, um, the need to come together with other emergency agencies to celebrate the, the good work happening by healthcare workers? Yeah, absolutely. So we've had these discussions as we talked earlier with the you know, Deputy Chief Paul Oliver and myself, and uh, we keep talking about you know some of the real heroes on the front line of this that are up to the eyeballs, really, in the trenches. And that's our nurses, our doctors, our care providers, the custodians that work at South Coast. Uh, they're really in it. They're surrounded by it. So you know we felt it appropriate to show them a little bit of admiration and gratitude for what they really do year round, but especially during this pandemic. So it was quite fitting and it was easy when we reached out to the, you know, the fire department and uh, the EMS to come together and show them that admiration. Um, then the command staff saw something very unique that I've not seen done anywhere else. And that was to you know, really celebrate all frontline workers. So can you tell me about the parade that uh, started on the south end of the city and ended far in the north um, earlier this month? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, the discussion with the, the Chief Paul Averni had brought up that most of us took this job knowing the hazards from uh, you know, um, first responders, doctors and nurses. But the grocery workers, they did not. You know, they took their job never thinking that they would be in the middle of the pandemic and up to the trenches. And really, those are unsung heroes. You know, we need nutrition. And without food, you know, society doesn't survive. And they're going to work every single day and didn't sign up for this. So we thought that would be a great way to show our gratitude for truly unsung heroes that did not sign up for that. So we started in the south end of New Bedford. Again, police, fire, and EMS. And we got a really long parade of emergency vehicles with sirens and lights and you know we went to the stop and shop and true cheese and price right and and we carried on to the middle of the city at market basket and continued to the north end and the employees came out and i i think it was so well received and they weren't expecting anybody uh holding them up to that level of really being heroes it was really an emotional day for many people and one of the things that I saw at almost every stop at almost every supermarket was a mutual show of admiration where you went, where the department and fire department and EMS went to celebrate their work and they came out clapping, thanking and showing you know, beautiful signage for the work you're doing. So how do you think that impacts morale all around? Uh, I'm gonna try to put myself in their shoes and I, I think the, the feeling of just admiration and gratitude and, and love, really, it, mm -hmm. it, it's a sign of love. Uh, I think it's gotta make you feel good. It's gonna make those tough days feel a little bit better uh, and just give you a sense of pride that what you're doing matters. It is essential. Mm -hmm. And you yourself as an individual are important to the big picture. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, again, it was a, it was a beautiful moment in time, and I uh, I've, I heard from so many people, both um, in person and via social media, how deeply it was appreciated. So, great idea, great output. We loved doing it. It was great. So, somehow throughout all of this, though, regular policing has continued. How has COVID-19 impacted your calls for service and criminal activity in the city? So uh, we've been tracking, as we always do at our ComStat, but more on a daily basis, trying to keep our finger on the pulse. And crime has, and calls for service in general, have all been reduced. So generally we go from about 180 to 220 calls per day, sometimes more times less, but that's our median. Uh, so when COVID-19 came in, we've dropped down to a medium of 80 to 120, sometimes 140 calls per day. So about a 40% give or take one way or the other drop in calls for service. We had anticipated 
calls going up for uh, domestic violence, but it did not. I've seen a couple little peaks here because we figured people are going to be confined and quarantined for a long period of time, and that was going to raise the level of conflict. Uh, but it could be because people can't call so easily because their batter is in it, which is of concern to us. But uh, every category, category of crime is dropped as well as calls for service. We've also done a few things to try to reduce our calls for service to minimize interaction with the public and preserve our staff and the minimize the spread uh, rate. And that's you know minor calls, uh, minor damage to property. We're trying to do telephonic reporting instead of the officer going to the house. We created a civilian report form and reintroduced that on our website so uh, citizens can complete a report and submit it that way without officer interaction. Again, for minor uh, cases, uh, we've uh, so we, we've done all those things and. COVID-19 has just minimized the calls for service. And I think when you talk to the hospital, they've seen a reduction in their emergency room as well. That's great. The, um, one of the areas of policing that is near and dear to everyone's heart is animal control. And they've really leaned in to making a difference to the lives of pet owners in this city. They, um, they partner with other animal rescue agencies to provide food for pet owners who are in marginal populations such as the disabled, the elderly, veterans. Can you tell me a bit about the work they've been doing? Yeah, so uh, again, you know, we just have such a great people. Manny Maciel is uh, our animal control supervisor for the, the animal control department. And uh, the other two uh, folks I work, that's just a great unit, you know, true animal lovers over there. And Manny's done a great job in collaborating and cooperating and getting other agencies to come together and take this cause during this pandemic to make sure that we, as you just said, provide food for dogs and cats to pet owners who do not have the means, especially during this pandemic. So great job by Manny and his team and all the other agencies that join them in that effort. Great. So now we're going to switch to something that I would refer to as hard news. Yeah. It's been six months since the Latin King raid. At this point in time, what changes have you seen as a result of that? So you know that the federal raid uh, was significant and a significant impact in our community because when you take that level of a, of a criminal from an, you know, an organization like the Latin Kings who are notorious for violence and you take them out of the environment and, and pretty much institutionalize them for, temp for a temporary time, we can all perceive or guess uh, what crimes would have happened. Can't really forecast it, but we can say for somewhat certainty that there would have been some additional violence if they were still working on the streets. So we've seen the positive impacts of them being taken out of the city. Unfortunately, they recently have been released. Uh, so we're monitoring that and we have a plan for that as well. Uh, but we're grateful for the AUSA's office and taking and the FBI and taking interest in those investigations and other cases that they are adopting recently. We may have a chance to talk about them mm -hmm. on the show if we have enough time. Tell me about that case now, then. Oh, great. Uh, I, I didn't know if we were going to have time. So recently, we had a gentleman by uh, Pizarro that our narcotics and gang unit has been doing a fabulous job, even during this COVID-19. You know, hats off to you know, Lieutenant Kagan and his team over there and Captain uh, Adelino Souza. So we've arrested this individual in the last two months at two separate occasions for gun charges, and he has a few other arrests. So grateful to the... U.S. Attorney's Office, they're going to adopt that case. And what that means is instead of him being charged here in Massachusetts through our Massachusetts court system, he will be charged in the federal courts, which generally means a stiffer sentence, which means he'll be out of New Bedford for a while. And it means quality of life, enhanced quality of life for our people, safety for our community. So thank you. Again, it sounds like collaboration with other agencies is a real strength of the department. It is. Uh, you know, that's something that we wanted to do when I came here four years ago as the chief, was to build relationships with all our law enforcement partners, local, state, and federal, and maximize our resources. And it, it's, it's helped, and it's working for sure. That's great. 
Um, recently, we had an act of great heroism by one of our officers, Tyler White, that you presented with a life-saving award. He's a rookie. He is, you know, he's really fresh. And I, I would like to know just a bit about your perspective on that when someone so young and so new makes such a difference. Well, I think that just goes to show you, you're never too young or too old or unexperienced or overexperienced to do the right thing when the time calls for it. And Tyler White absolutely stepped up and saved the man's life. And as I told him the other day when we pinned that red and white life-saving award uh, medal on his chest, like many of the officers like him, there's someone living today because of him. And there's a whole slew of people that are grateful that are close to that individual. So hats off to Officer White, and uh, we're looking forward to great things from him. Fantastic. Now the weather's warming up. It is. What can we expect during the months ahead from the department in terms of policing as it relates to, you know, pandemic guidelines and uh, what, what your recommendations are for the public to stay safe? Sure. Again, uh, our officers are going to be out there doing what they've been doing right along. Uh, they've been very active in terms of uh, doing the traditional policing, which is enforcing the law. Uh, community policing has had to take a, a slight step back because of the social distancing. But going forward, uh, we plan on, you know, supporting the community and enticing and encouraging them to follow the, the governor and our mayor's guidelines in social distancing, wearing a mask, uh, especially in public, washing their hands quite often. We will encourage that and foster those guidelines as much as we can. Uh, and I expect great compliance from our community because we are a city of one and I have seen nothing but that from this community, a community that wants to work together, that wants to be cooperative and collaborative. Uh, and I think we're coming close to the end of our show, Melissa. Uh, so I want to thank you for coming on uh, today. I want to thank you for the wonderful work that you're doing for the police department and for our city. Uh, you've been a godsend and a fresh of breath here. So thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. And again, I just really want to express my admiration for the incredible work that I see your officers and civilians do every day. I as well. So again, hats off to all our police officers and our civilian employees. You're the best and I appreciate it. And to you at home, please stay tuned for our next Meet NBPD. I hope you come back and I want to give you my gratitude and a little bit of my love to you for being so cooperative and supporting our men and women. Thank you.